Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this video. There haven't been many projects that tackle the concept of pure, blood-boiling rage quite like Netflix's beef. The premise of a road rage incident progressing into off-the-rails revenge schemes piqued my interest, and the involvement of Ali Wong, Steven Yun, and A24 didn't hurt either. But I'll admit, I wasn't ready for the existential emotional roller coaster that would ensue. The series is an impressive showcase of character study, created by Lee Sung Jin, who incorporated elements of his own experiences. I thought there was a show there about two people who have a lot going on in their individual lives that this incident sort of unravels. Beef instantly tapped into something I'd always felt but never meaningfully acknowledged, our complex inner relationship with anger and resentment, and how it relates to feelings of hopelessness and detachment. I think anger is misunderstood and perhaps overly demonized in some ways. You might think, but people are constantly angry on the internet, it's incredibly normalized. Trust me, I know. But like in beef, it's often easier to rail against strangers than it is to confront our seemingly powerless position in reality. To add a disclaimer, manifesting anger through abuse, violence, or bigotry is never okay. But anger isn't inherently negative or harmful. The difference tends to lie in the ways we express it. In beef, we get to watch two characters express it in the pettiest ways possible, eventually taking them to an unexpected place where they have no choice but to directly face the root of their fury. I think at the heart of the show is an exploration of the insulated nature of today's human experience, and how even our most toxic and avoidant actions are often reflections of a desire to feel less alone, a longing to feel understood in a world that seems to want to squeeze us more and more into black and white boxes none of us really fit into. So in this video, I want to delve into how Beef manages to validate that not so pleasant gray area we all share, and the catharsis of interpersonal and creative expression. Beef begins in a store as Danny, played by Steven Yun, attempts to return several hibachi grills. Immediately, we're led to relate to the everyday annoyance of failing to accomplish anything in a customer service interaction. But as the cashier remarks about how Danny's returned the same grills three times, I see you returning the carbon monoxide detector again. The show hints at the state of his mental health. Individually, these little nuisances aren't what push us over the edge, but they're all drops in a bucket, some bigger than others that will inevitably overflow. Like when you drop your keys or stub your toe and suddenly you're having a full-blown meltdown. Danny, after being denied a refund because he lost the receipt, pulls out of his parking spot only to be honked at and given the finger by Amy, played by Ali Wong. This is his breaking point. The idea came from a real road rage thing that I went through. It honked at me, cursed at me, and drove away, and for some reason on that day, I was like, I'm gonna follow you. What ensues is a road rage incident of epic proportions, where they go out of their way to antagonize and intimidate each other, ending with Amy getting the best of Danny. But as she drives away, Danny memorizes her license plate, ensuring that this would only be the start of their Throughout the show, we come to understand that each character, even those with relatively minor roles in the story, hold deep-seated anger, the source of which they're seemingly incapable of confronting head-on. In nearly every case, uncomfortable emotions are bottled up, only to reveal themselves in severe or bizarre outbursts, like Amy's erotic power fantasy with a gun, or Danny forcing down four chicken sandwich meals in one sitting to cope with stress. I wish I could tell you my diet's been any better than Danny's, but it could get rough out here. That's why I want to thank today's sponsor, AG1. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement I've been using to fill in the gaps in my diet. I'll be real, it's difficult to keep up perfectly balanced meals every day that meet every criteria I need to stay on top of my health. AG1's comprehensive formula, which includes 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients, makes it really convenient to reach a lot of those nutrient thresholds without having to think too much about it. I've been drinking it every morning before breakfast, and recently used the travel packets when I was out of town for a few days. The taste definitely grew on me, and since incorporating it into my routine a few weeks ago, I've had better energy levels throughout the day. It supports my immune system, and without getting into TMI, it helps with my digestive habits and my gut health, since it includes prebiotics and probiotics. Plus, I think it's important to mention I trust AG1 because it's NSF certified for sport to ensure high quality and safety, and it's even manufactured in New Zealand where they're pretty strict on guidelines for nutritional supplements. If you want to try AG1 for yourself, go to drinkag1.com slash qualityculture. It's linked in the description. They're offering a free one-year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. So check them out. And thanks again to AG1 for sponsoring. Now back to the video. 
It's just in nature here is vile and base. The first episode's title references director Werner Herzog during a making of documentary for his film Fitzcarraldo. The birds are in misery. I don't think they, they sing, they just screech in pain. In fact, all of the episode titles are quotes from films and literature, each giving us a taste of the character psyches. The title cards also feature somewhat abstract works of art, almost all of which were painted by David Cho, who played Isaac in the show. The one exception is the first, a meat stall with the holy family giving alms by Peter Artson. This striking image evokes not only the material meaning of beef, but the elaborate, chaotic essence of the events that take place, especially as it's accompanied by Herzog's words. By the way, I'm going to be breaking down all the title cards over on our $2 Patreon if you're interested in supporting the channel and seeing some bonus content. At first glance, Herzog's comment appears like a deep observation on the brutality of nature, how it's not this gentle and pure, picturesque fantasy, but a realm plagued by violence and indignities. It somewhat mirrors the show's themes about our overriding tendency to suppress anger. There's often a guise of positivity and romanticism while rage bubbles under the surface, constantly ignored or dismissed. Like when Amy tries to vent to her husband about the road rage incident. You gotta start focusing on the positive. He shuts her down with feel-good platitudes, something he presumably does all the time. Anger is just a transitory state of consciousness. Remember what Dr. Lin said, we owe it to ourselves to stay positive. However, digging a little further into the context of Herzog's comment, you begin to realize he was just a man pushed to the brink of madness. That sounds a little extreme, but it really got to that. The film's production was a famously harrowing ordeal, but the root of his frustration came from lead actor Klaus Kinski, who was notoriously difficult to work with, to the point that the native extras offered to kill Kinski because they were so deeply upset by his behavior. But Herzog declined since he needed him to complete filming. A true humanitarian. Clearly, he wasn't really trying to make a profound statement about nature or humanity with that line about the birds. He was just stuck in an insufferable state of affairs with someone he couldn't stand. And sometimes that can make birdsong just sound like screeching. The quote's origins parallel the hostile dynamic between Danny and Amy. And like Herzog, they're both in particular moments of their lives that set them over the edge. The first episode ends with Danny getting back at Amy. Hi by peeing all over her bathroom floor before gleefully running away. In this moment, we see a new glimmer in Danny and Amy's eyes. Danny with his childlike grin and Amy's subtle smirk, like their lives have been reinvigorated by a new purpose. The inclusion of Hoobastank's The Reason as Amy chases after Danny is fitting. What the fuck? The song is about grappling with our imperfections, the guilt that comes with our mistakes, and discovering something that actually makes us want to live. For Danny and Amy, their interactions present a cathartic break from the Sisyphean rat race and putting on a happy face. Almost like an inverse of the rom-com meet cute, they find an outlet for their pent-up rage. A stranger they can pin all their frustrations on. Yo, I'll leave when I want to leave, bitch. And we'll keep sitting here, you shriveled nut. It was the kernel of the idea of having two people kind of trapped in their subjective realities and projecting so many assumptions onto the other person. She's some rich bitch from Calabasas. You know, she's probably sitting at home all day eating like baguettes and jam or some shit. From here, the series follows their back and forth attempts at one-upping each other, while expanding on the ins and outs of their personal lives which compel them to keep stoking the flames. It continues with Amy painting obscenities on Danny's truck, before we get a glimpse of just how dark things could get, as Danny nearly sets fire to Amy's car before realizing her daughter was inside. Paul, turn that shit off, dude! I almost lit a baby on fire! These instances spiral from Amy having an affair with Danny's brother to Danny planning to rob Amy. Eventually, the house Danny builds for his parents burns down, and as he tries to frame Amy for it, he assaults her husband, accidentally kidnaps their daughter, and his cousin holds her for ransom. Yeah, it's a lot, but it's also pretty hilarious. That, what, what you did was not nice! It's not nice to do that! And while it probably never got that out of hand, both of the main characters are inspired by creator Lee Sung Jin's personal life. Although I have a sneaking suspicion that Ali Wong played a part in crafting Amy's character, since they share similar backstories of self-made half-Chinese, half-Vietnamese women married to Japanese Nepo babies who aren't quite as successful as their fathers. Jin based Danny and Amy on his opposing experiences, as someone trying to make it to his next paycheck, struggling to survive, versus his newfound status as a successful writer. Like, she got a house? She has kids? Like, what do I got? I've been both Danny and Amy, you know. Uh, when I started writing, I was quite poor and uh, had a lot of Dannyisms constantly. 
Danny is a struggling handyman. I'm a contractor. Living with his unemployed brother and carries immense guilt for the loss of his parents' family business and the resulting move back to Korea. This guilt, along with his struggle to make ends meet, points to why he bought all those grills in the first place, as he's been grappling with suicidal ideations. The hibachi stuff in the show, that's like ripped from the headlines. Mm. Wow. Like I went to Home Depot uh, in Playa Vista, I bought hibachi grills, I bought a carbon monoxide detector, and you know, did the whole Danny thing. Oh, wow. I like Googled what's the least painful way to kill yourself. While Danny struggles to find work and provide for his family, Amy falls on the opposite end of the class spectrum. She's a well-off entrepreneur, wife, and mother, which on the surface paints a picture-perfect life. But these factors contribute to an overwhelming sense of responsibility that intensifies her hidden anxieties and insecurities. She's constantly stressed about work and providing for her family, while also juggling many of the domestic tasks expected of mothers. I gotta call Amy. She handles all the house stuff. Not to mention, she actively keeps up a facade of living a happy life, projecting an idealized image of herself at all times. Despite what everybody tells you, you can have it all. When do I get to enjoy something? Oh. In their own ways, they feel trapped. I always thought the hustle was like the cause of this like feeling, but now I'm starting to wonder if it's just like always there. Danny's stuck in what feels like an endless cycle of chasing this fleeting idea of happiness, whether it's having a lot of money or by making his parents proud. He even drives out an hour plus to what he thinks is the best Burger King, just to gorge himself on their supposedly superior chicken sandwiches. In one scene, Danny essentially asks her if money is the answer, whether she's happy and fulfilled by all her accomplishments. I just want to know if I gotta get to where you are. To which she replies, everything fades, nothing lasts. We're just a snake eating its own tail. Amy seems to have everything Danny dreams of, yet she feels just as trapped. Closed in by the image of perfection, she feels compelled to uphold. In the set design, Grace spaced out those bars in Amy's home. She calculated to this perfect amount where it's seemingly zen, but her house also feels like a cage. I always felt like this is supposed to be nice, and I asked for this, but I do feel a little trapped. Even in couples therapy, it's as though she replaces one mask for another. She describes childhood traumas and the cultural barriers that prevent her from opening up. I think that growing up with my parents taught me to repress all my feelings. These are very real issues, but the way she articulates this self-awareness makes it feel like she's trying to get the right answer on a test, like therapy is just another game to be won. She seems startled when the therapist says this is a good start, but they have a long way to go, as if Amy expected that simply acknowledging her traumas would be enough. In certain ways, Amy and Danny seem to want to fulfill the expectations of the Asian American model minority myth. I know my parents love me. They, they showed me that through sacrifice. <laughs> but did their love ever feel conditional? Amy overwhelms herself by trying to maintain her successful persona, while Danny tries to scratch and claw his way up the social ladder. There's always something. Yes, there's always something. It reminds me of John Cho's remarks about the hidden internal anger many Asian Americans carry. Because I do feel like Asian American men, no one knows this except Asian American men, at least for a portion of our lives, we walk around with, in our pocket is a clenched fist. And we're ready, we're ready to fight because people have been shitting on our heads all our lives. Cho is mostly referring to Asian American men, who of course have their own distinct experiences in Western society. But for both men and women, there's a constant burden of living up to the ideals of our immigrant parents and communities, and the stereotype of smart, successful, upper-class Asian Americans projected onto us. In regards to Danny, his relationship to his heritage is especially interesting since he constantly espouses these unfounded beliefs. You know who you should talk to? Ah, Western therapy doesn't work on Eastern minds. These little comments reveal that to him, these assumptions are principles that should dictate his life and that if he follows them, he'll be happy. It's okay to mess around with white girls right now, but like, when you gotta settle down, you gotta listen to mom and dad bring home a nice Korean girl. But even though he promotes the standard of bringing home a nice Korean girl, we learn that he fetishizes white women all the same. Maybe on a writing level, it was a reversal of how Asian women are so often fetishized by white men, but it reveals Danny's hypocrisy and the fragility of his supposed virtues. Based on flashbacks of childhood bullying and some offhand comments, they act like they got no power. They got all of it. Paul's cleaning his room, white devil pulling strings. Danny's fixation seems to be rooted in an inferiority complex. It always fucked with me that she wasn't married to some like white dude or some shit. Along with this, in general, there's a cultural pressure to sweep unpleasant feelings, thoughts, and emotions under the rug, especially in the sphere of interpersonal relationships. 
We're often encouraged, however subtly, to repress these experiences, to deny these facets of our character in order to maintain the facade of collective happiness. The characters in Beef smother and conceal distressing emotions, all under the belief that they inherently negate or prevent happiness, instead of what they actually do, which is help signal what's making us unhappy. Still, the anger slips out in one form or another. We see this with the guy at church who's only polite to Danny on the surface, but gets aggressively competitive on the basketball court before resorting to petty pranks as payback. I was jealous, but like a normal jealous, not like burn down your house. He's a reminder of the futility of comparison. Danny wants what he has, and he wants what Danny has. Or the vain socialite, who at one point makes it her life's mission to ruin Amy's reputation. I appreciate it that for the most part, the characters come off as real, complicated people. Sorry for yelling, first of all. I, I need to work on that. Not necessarily all good or bad, but existing in the ever-complex in-between, oscillating between good and bad behaviors that don't necessarily encompass their entire personality, especially because these behaviors don't emerge in a vacuum. The church guy holds on to jealousy because his wife had a fling with Danny way back when. I overheard her saying that you're the best she's ever had. And the socialite lady just wanted a friend, but felt repeatedly rejected, belittled, and used by Amy. It must be so nice getting to spend all day at home with Izzy. No, it's great. Can I call you back later? Me? Mm, sure. Sure, yeah, call me back whenever. So she lashed out, before eventually apologizing when she learned new info. The more we learn about these characters, the clearer it becomes that they all struggle with communication and connection. A lot of their frustrations appear to stem from a sense of isolation, believing they have no one to turn to, lending to a feeling of helplessness they can't quite shake. The third episode's title, taken from the poem Elm by Sylvia Plath, conveys this plainly, I am inhabited by a cry. In the passage, Plath goes on to write, Nightly it flaps out looking, with its hooks, for something to love. I think the line conveys how our destructive actions, at times, originate from a yearning for connection. Notably, Amy and Danny find solace in berating the other whenever their lives are at their loneliest and most unsatisfying. As for supporting characters, Amy's husband George is an isolated stay-at-home dad, whose partner's life is ruled by her career. At the same time, he feels inadequate compared to his accomplished father, and possibly even Amy. To fill this void, he searches for connections elsewhere, like his emotional affair, and also his friendship with Zane, who's actually just Danny, but still. I'm so glad I met you, man. <laughs> I've been kind of lonely lately. His mother Fumi is judgmental and pretentious. Is modeled after the contours of my own backside. Which leads us to believe she'll be a one-dimensional archetype of the annoying mother-in-law. But when Amy cancels her lunch plans, we see Fumi's also wrestling with loneliness in the wake of her husband's death. Even Danny's rough around the edges cousin Isaac seems to want to build a more tight-knit relationship. But Danny doesn't seem receptive to it. I don't want to do shit by myself, man. F hang with me, man. Why are you showing me this? Why am I showing you? You're my fucking family, dude. So it's interesting when Amy resorts to catfishing Danny's younger brother Paul, they actually develop a genuine connection. It seems they're more willing to be honest with each other and open up about their inner lives in ways they can't with other people. And Amy even expresses her sexuality more boldly. I think their openness stems from the fact that they're strangers. There's no history to consider, no baggage about how their words might be received, no mutual friends or acquaintances they could potentially spill each other's secrets to. In a strange way, even though he's constantly trying to distance himself from Danny, Amy offers the kind of guidance Paul wishes his brother gave him. He's just looking for guidance from like somebody, anybody, because you can't do it. This particularly stings for Danny because he wants to be that kind of brother for Paul. Activate your corpo. Their whole lives, Danny frames himself as someone who could take care of his family, someone clever enough to figure out how to run a business, but at every step, he fails. While it's unclear how much of the blame he should take for his parents having to move back to Korea, he loses the money Isaac lent to him, and it was his fault the new house he built for his parents burned down. We found faulty wiring. An absolute moron installed this. To make up for his deep shame, he consistently bites off more than he could chew and overestimates his own savviness, which only adds to his self-hatred. And though he wants to fulfill his duty as a dependable son and big brother, he's unable to get past his own fear of isolation, to the point he actively sabotages his brother to keep him close. Yo, I threw away your college applications. I just wanted us to be the same. Meanwhile, Amy spends a good chunk of the season trying to secure a business deal with the woman who represents what Amy could become if wealth is all she aspires to. Everything fades, Amy. People, things, experiences. 
Jordan can afford pretty much anything money can buy, including cultural artifacts from all over the world that realistically don't mean anything to her. So she resorts to seeking out things she can't have. She wants an art piece made by Amy's father-in-law because it's not for sale, and does something of a power play in negotiation, dangling the business deal over Amy's head. She even wrecks her brother's marriage and starts a relationship with his wife, someone she clearly doesn't care much for. Nothing brings her true satisfaction because she's not seeking any meaningful connection to the world. You just gotta keep grabbing what you can, right? Her new wife is as important as the chair to her, just a commodity or a prize that loses its value once she obtains it. She's the dog that caught the car, the snake eating its own tail. That's what makes life so wonderful. There's always something. You know, it's calling back to the, there's always something that both Danny and Amy have said. There's always something. Yes. There's always something. There's always something. There's so much kind of pain in the way that she's saying it as if she also has been distraught by this feeling, but that her only solution is to keep buying, keep consuming. And so it's meant to be like advice, but then she has this like undercurrent of pain. In the end, the door to her panic room, i.e. the symbol of her obscene excess, literally tears her apart. Amy, on the other hand, strives for financial security so she can spend more time with her daughter, and because she had relatively little of it growing up. Do you ever notice how it's only people who have money that think money isn't important? But like Paul hinted, her time-consuming career isn't the only thing holding her back from feeling at peace in her life. In a flashback sequence, Amy's childhood introduces us to the witch, an imaginary figure who becomes a years-long physical manifestation of Amy's shame. The witch appears in moments of guilt, whether it's eating food she's not supposed to, discovering her father's affair and keeping it a secret, or during instances of promiscuity in adulthood. In the latter, Amy becomes the witch in the mirror, reflecting how the true source of this severe scrutiny and judgment is Amy herself. Because the witch isn't an indicator of what other people think of her, only a figment of her own critical mind. I can't tell anyone your secrets because no one would love you. There must be some point where we all like fall outside the reach of love. Amy perfectly illustrates a common intense fear of rejection. The belief that our truest, deepest selves are reprehensible and unlovable. So we're afraid to expose ourselves, to lay ourselves bare. It's a tragic irony because at the same time, we all yearn to feel understood. But sometimes it feels like if I tell you things, you're just, you're not gonna understand. I think this particularly relates to the title of the fifth episode, Such Inward Secret Creatures. The phrase is taken from the novel The Sea, The Sea by Iris Murdoch, which explores disguises, delusion, and the impulse to craft public personas more virtuous than what our real inner motivations suggest. Relevantly, at one point, the main character writes, Of course, this chattering diary is a facade, the literary equivalent of the everyday smiling face, which hides the inward ravages of jealousy, remorse, fear, and the consciousness of irretrievable moral failure. Mom, I drove all the way up here to tell you something. Yet when Amy does try to open up to her family, she's continually dismissed. Like when she tries to confess about her father's affair, her mother makes her drop the subject. It reminded me of the film The Farewell, where her family hides their matriarch's terminal illness from her in the interest of collectivist harmony. But in this case, rather than being a selfless act to preserve the peace of mind of a beloved family member, it's a lie that paints over the cracks of her family's foundation, reinforcing the idea that there are unspeakable secrets better off ignored and forgotten for the betterment of everyone. What do you mean? You and Dad already talked about it? No. We don't have to. And you and I don't have to either. So even though, unlike Danny, she technically fulfilled her duty as a successful daughter and paid off her parents' mortgage, their relationship is clearly strained. We went all over Europe together. Well, if you had stayed in touch, you'd know all this. And it's never enough, as they want a vacation home now too. But perhaps most significantly, her parents, including her father's adultery, remind her more and more of herself. And she hates it. Amy also tries to share her innermost feelings with George, but as we've seen, he's a pretty lousy communicator. Never mind. No, really? I understand. And I get down to... Her one saving grace was a belief that her daughter June could somehow save her from herself, describing her birth as a perfect moment in time she wishes she never left. No emails, no pretending, and there was nothing wrong anywhere in the entire universe. But even June couldn't give her that redemptive, unconditional love she longed for. Most of the characters in Beef feel powerless in their lives and lost in the shuffle of cosmic randomness, so they cling on to the few things they can control. 
When applying this to the real world, it's not hard to imagine that when people feel trapped or helpless, they may find relief in exercising control over someone else's life, even if just for a moment, so they can feel they have power over something, anything. They want you to feel like you have no control. Related to that, one element I noticed again and again, not just in the narrative, but in the show's presentation itself, was the notion of art and creativity as a form of emotional catharsis. In a meta sense, the series allowed Lee Sung Jin to articulate his most intimate ideas and feelings. And significantly, artistic expression periodically pops up as a means for characters to release their stifled emotions. Danny not only found community through church, but also music, as both audience and performer. It's a vulnerable side of him we rarely see during other parts of the show. Meanwhile, June expresses herself through painting, which we learn helps her cope with her own anger. When George and his mother perhaps overly push her to make art, Amy tries to dissuade them from putting unnecessary pressure on her. Painting helps with her anxiety and she just stopped picking her skin, so uh... June's art, especially in contrast to her parents, is perhaps the best example of pure expression, based solely on her inner passions rather than any outward expectations. George's art is basically trash, like if somebody actually polished a turd and called it art. On the one hand, these glittery poops are clearly meant to poke fun at the pretentiousness and artificiality of the fine art world, but they also help illustrate George's insecurities. Old pieces are embarrassing, they're garbage. Even he doesn't really like them and only seems to make them out of a sense of obligation to live up to his father's name. My first thought was, I wonder if he died disappointed. I feel like a fraud, you know? It's telling that when he finally opens up to somebody and partially relinquishes this pressure, he ends up making art he genuinely likes and that other people seem to admire too. To be real, it still just looks like an evolved version of the Dookie vases to me, but what do I know? In comparison, Amy's plant business could be considered a form of creativity too. It may have even started out as just a fun hobby. But like many creative pursuits turned into profit-seeking ventures, at least some of the enjoyment and fulfillment gets sapped from the experience. Money declares its intent to cheapen great art. Amy, of course, has a point that money does matter in a plethora of ways. But still, the art is somewhat made less gratifying by its requirement to yield a profit. Then again, she doesn't seem all that knowledgeable about her field in the first place. I thought you said you are a plant expert. I just Google shit and pretend that I am. So maybe it was always about money. Either way, artistic expression can often only go so far in satisfying our need to feel understood. The characters in Beef all long to build connections with someone, but for one reason or another, they get rejected. It's particularly ironic because for almost every one of these shunned people, they neglect someone else who wants to be close to them. But soon, Danny and Amy are forced by circumstance to rely on each other and come the closest they've ever been to another person. By the end of the chaotic ninth episode, with nothing left to lose, the two engage in a car chase just like their very first interaction, before accidentally driving off a cliff as a couple of crows look on. Crows have recurring mentions and appearances throughout the show. Danny in particular seems to have developed something of a kinship with local crows over the years. You hear that? Crows love me! He found an injured crow and he nursed it back to health. Okay. He did that. Crows are highly intelligent and communicative, and in popular culture, they commonly symbolize bad omens of death and misfortune, or good omens of reflection and rebirth. In Beef, they seem to represent both. The show also references a study where researchers tested crows' memory and recognition by donning masks, including a Dick Cheney mask. And the crows talked to other crows, and all over the country, no matter where Dick Cheney was, crows would attack his ass. The story didn't really go down like that. The Cheney mask was actually the neutral control group. Still, crows do remember faces, gossip with each other, and hold grudges. They would just be chirping at his face, like pecking him and shit. So following up on this Chekhov's gun, the final episode opens with the crows praising Danny for his past kindness and mobilizing against Amy for her past aggression. Because of them, she loses the upper hand when she and Danny have a standoff in the desert. For a while, they wander alone aimlessly, and when they finally come across each other again, they shout their conversation from afar. Use nice words! I think this visual is narratively significant for a particular reason. Starting in episode 7, we're periodically shown a flash of an inscrutable image, what looks like dirt, with no explanation, usually appearing when Amy or Danny are lost in thought. Now in the desert, they scream at each other from a considerable distance, until recognizing they probably need the other to survive and begin to close the gap, not just physically, but emotionally. 
All of their responsibilities and insecurities are left behind with society, and their stuckness, along with their fear of incoming death, gives them the opportunity to finally open up. The hallucinogenic plants they're tripping on don't hurt either. They spill every uncomfortable shame and fear, at a certain point even becoming one, swapping each other's dialogue and traits. Yo, by the way, what's up with your tattoo? This is number 22. At the end of their prolonged trip, we finally understand the source of the mysterious image from before. It's the last little space of Earth left after they close the literal and figurative distance between them. It ties into the episode's title, Figures of Light, a phrase from Carl Jung's Psychology and Alchemy. There was a Carl Jung quote uh, that really was the North Star for, for a lot of the writing, and uh, he says, uh, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The quote continues, the latter procedure, however, is disagreeable and therefore not popular. I don't want anyone to see who I really am. Jung urges us to dig into and accept what we seek to deny, to relinquish our egos and acknowledge our absurdities. Danny and Amy were finally able to do just that in the finale. And the David Cho painting they chose for the title card was the perfect artist impression. A dark figure on his hands and knees, an outburst of colorful light pouring from his chest. We spend a lot of times like with our masks and personas on as we interact with one another. And I think that separateness causes us to feel like, oh, these things that we only know in our own brains, like no one else does that can lead to like shame and isolation and feeling alone. If we would just kind of like take our masks off once in a while, I think the need to go as crazy with um, expressing some of these things wouldn't be as high. When they wake up to the fact that they didn't die, <laughs> they embark on their second chance at life together, at one point literally walking towards the light at the end of the tunnel. The moment is interrupted by George shooting Danny, but the point still stands. In the hospital, we watch as Amy wraps Danny in a hopeful embrace, as colorful beams of light flow over them, denoting the passage of time. Now, here I am at South By with a show, and I'm probably still sat inside, and uh, <laughs> this feeling uh, kind of never goes away, and so you have to try and figure out how to, how to accept it and live with it, and I think that's why I wrote the show the way I did. Amy and Danny's story suggests that timeless adage, that if we want the rewards of being loved, we have to submit to the mortifying ordeal of being known. This won't mean all our problems will be solved, or that we'll forever be consoled and shielded from pain, but maybe it can serve to shape the rage into something more. Something that, like the show, gives us a chance at that ever elusive connection. Thanks for watching. Again, if you'd like to see a full breakdown of all the episode titles and artwork, check out Patreon for that and some other cool bonus content there too. But let me know your thoughts on the wild roller coaster ride that was beef. Thanks again to AG1 for sponsoring, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>